Good morning. How y'all doing this morning? Cold? Well, before we start with the prayer, this is the prayer updates that were sent out yesterday. Uh, Richard Blaisdell's doing well, recovering from his heart surgery. He's gaining his strength back slowly, but surely. So uh, hopefully he will. He and Teresa will be here and worship today as well, although I don't expect them to stay around a long time. So if you see them and want to say hi, be quick. Uh, Ray Chapman, Peggy Garvin's uncle, is in ICU in Louisiana with a brain bleed. And the, the update said he's not doing well, so please keep him and that family in your prayers. Norma Greer is still recovering from a recent neck surgery. Uh, continue to pray for her. Melba Griffin had a good pathology report and doesn't need more treatment right now, so that's a good thing. Ross Hollingsworth has had some balance issues and continues to struggle with his vision. So, and I don't know. I haven't talked to Kevin recently, so I don't know, you know, what his physical strength is. I know he was just spending a lot of time resting. Margaret Johnson's dealing with a lot of swelling in her feet. She had an ultrasound yesterday, and this email came out Friday, so that would have been on Thursday and it's affecting her balance some, so please keep her in your prayers. And my cousin, Kathleen McElwain, was found to have inoperable cancer about a week ago, so she's undergoing chemo treatments, rigorous chemo treatments, and radiation. Uh, so appreciate it if you keep her in your prayers. That whole family has had a tremendous number of trials. Brian Rendon and his family lost an aunt suddenly uh, Thursday night after losing an uncle two weeks ago. So that family's been devastated by loss. And Barbara Sutton's getting better from COVID, but she still has fatigue from it. So keep praying for her. Are there any others that we need to add to the prayer list this morning? Any others? Okay. Let's start with a prayer then. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings of giving us a new day to use to glorify you in all that we do and say. Help us not ever lose track of that responsibility of ours. We thank you for this time to get today to assemble, to study your word together. We thank you for the care that you're giving those that were named on this prayer list and those that weren't named but need your help in any case. We all of us have our own private prayer lists that we pray for. and There are others that have been mentioned in the past that may not be completely healed. We ask, Father, that you would see to their needs as well. Help those that are serving their health needs do a good job of it. Help whatever medications or treatments they might be receiving be beneficial to restoring their health. Help us serve their needs in whatever capacity we're capable of. Let us always remember to do good to those that are around us, especially those in the church. We pray for your blessings today as we study your word and help each of us to find something in it that we can use to improve our lives for the rest of our life, Father. We ask your forgiveness for your, our sins because those create barriers that are very difficult for us to surmount. Forgive us, help us to make amends as best we can as quickly as we recognize the problems we have caused and the sin we've committed. So please be merciful, Father. Help us to learn, give us knowledge and wisdom and understanding 
It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. So we'll be in the Gospel of John for 21 weeks, but it won't be me teaching all of it. See, God is merciful. (laughs) Are we ready to go? That's my own clicker. It's supposed to work. Oh. <laughs> it worked over there. These things are sources of temptation to say the wrong things. Okay. In your Bibles, if you're open to the Gospel of John, who wrote this? How do we know that? Because he doesn't, nowhere in there does he write like Paul did in some of his letters that with his own hand, I've written this, I, John, have written this. How do we know that? Basically, from very early in the second century, within the lifetime, people that had been taught by John early, earlier in their life were quoting it directly. Uh, Ignatius in 110 AD quotes John 3.8 nearly verbatim. He's Probably like us, we remember what it says, but we don't remember the exact words, so we paraphrase what he said. It's still accurate in our paraphrasing. That's what Ignatius did. Basilides in 120 AD quotes John 1, 9 exactly. And so with certainly within 50 years, of it being written, then perhaps as late as 30 years after it was written, it's being quoted. The early church never had any controversy about where this came from. So it's dependable. Why did John write this? You have to read the last verse in chapter 20 to find out, but he states specifically. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's why he wrote this gospel. It's not structured like Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's built so that you can believe that Jesus is the Christ. And if you believe that, then you may have life in his name. And the subjunctive verb mood is used there simply because you have to live your life faithfully to have life in his name. You can start out faithfully, not end faithfully, and you lose your life. So he's writing this so that people could believe. It's interesting that the in this gospel, he periodically explains Jewish terms. So the audience clearly was not to Christians that had a Jewish background. It's probably a mix. And since he lived in Ephesus the latter part of his life, at at the church in Ephesus was mixed Jewish and Gentile. So he's explaining 
he rewards to, to people, Christians that are both potential Christians that didn't know Hebrew. That's what he's trying to do. How did he write it? Not with pen and papyrus, but he wrote this gospel with a strong focus on Jesus' identity. Remember the purpose that he writes it for, so he wants everyone that reads it to understand Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Word of God. He is the Son of God. He has selective, it's got selective content in it. He says that much more could have been written, so much more that the world couldn't hold all the books about what Jesus did. So, and the sum total that we have in the Gospels, it's not a complete record of everything Jesus did. And it's not necessarily a complete record of everything he said. They spent three and a half years with him. How long does it take to read all four Gospels? Doesn't take three and a half years unless you're really not spending any time in it. So, there's a great deal more that Jesus taught them that is not recorded. Nothing mystical or anything, it's just not, not there. When he sent the Holy Spirit to them, the Holy Spirit didn't inspire them to write everything that he said and did. It has an evangelistic tone to it. And we'll see that, the beginnings of that in the first chapter. And why would it have that? Is so that it can accomplish what the per accomplish the purpose that John said he was writing it for. It was written somewhere between 70 AD and 80 to 90. Uh, he doesn't, there's no mention of Jerusalem being destroyed. John's really not, not writing a history of the Jewish people here. But that's not mentioned. If he wrote it 80 or 90, also he would have been somewhere close. At, by 90 AD, he would have been probably in his mid to late 80s. Uh, he... Uh, Trajan assist, uh, ascended the throne in Rome in 98 AD. And there is a historian that mentioned that John lived, okay, great, in Ephesus, was still living in Ephesus when Trajan ascended the throne. So we can figure that John was an old man when he passed away from natural causes. The only apostle that that happened to. Okay. Good. John 1 through 3. What does that say there? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. John is clearly a theological, uh, is clearly theological in nature, explaining the nature and the will of God. Uh, as, he's, as he's revealed himself to man. He existed before creation. He was with God and he was God. When we think of people, it's very difficult for us to wrap our heads around that. The closest parallel, and it's a very poor one, is if you've ever argued with yourself about something. But... Jesus and God would not have argued, and the Holy Spirit, and it's not like me, myself, and I have to decide what I'm going to do today. They are all perfectly in concert with one another. And Jesus said he would send the, the Spirit who was exactly like him. So whatever we're told about Jesus does apply to the Holy Spirit as well. All things were made through him. And there's multiple passages 
in the New Testament that reinforce that. Colossians 1, 16, 17. 1 Corinthians 8 and 6. Hebrews 1 and 2. 1 verse 2 and also verse 10. So all of those make reference to things existing because he has made them and he keeps them going. Next. John 1, 4 through 8. All right, there's... I don't know what's wrong with that little receiver over there. Uh, John 1, 4 through 8. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Doesn't make any difference how we see things. The darkness hasn't overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Now, is this a reference to John who wrote the gospel or someone else? Yeah, it's a reference to John the Baptist, as we call him. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came, but came to bear witness about the light. Now, light provides life to mankind, doesn't it? And you see that starting, well, when God breathes life into a pile of dirt that he made into Adam. But it also shows up in Genesis 2. When the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat, out of, eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. There's light in action there. The beginning of God's, apparently of God's teaching mankind. Don't eat the fruit of that tree. Very simple. How do we raise children when they're very young? What's the first thing we're telling them? I didn't know I had a class of people that didn't have children. What did you teach them when they were young? Yeah. Distilled down, that's it. I love you. Don't touch that. You know? Kids that touch hot stoves probably won't touch the stove again. Even though they've been warned not to do it. They suffer as a result of it. That's what God is telling Adam is, and Eve, don't, touch, don't eat the fruit of that tree. Light is trying to provide life. They get to the side though, right? And they did. They made a poor decision. Light shines in the darkness and it's not overcome. Are any of you deer hunters? Okay. Lois, did you raise your hand? None of you have been out deer hunting? Ever? Yes. Okay. All right, Ben. You hunt? What's the legal hours for hunting? Dawn of that, yeah. When I was hunting, it was 30 minutes after sundown. You could not shoot a deer. Even with a spotlight. The what? Even with a spotlight. That's right. Because the sun goes down, there's still enough light to see, but 30 minutes later, you're supposed to pack it up, head back to the cabin or the camp or whatever. Did you ever finish the day walking back to your deer camp when it was getting dark? What's it like? Maybe 
and you're walking through the woods or the brush, what, ha what happens when you see the lights of the camp or the cabin? How do you feel? Relief. Relief. Yeah. Yeah, and probably hungry. But the deer cabin in the darkness, I used to hunt with a friend of mine when I was working for a living. And his property had an awful lot of scrub oak on it, very brushy. But there were trails through it. And at the close of the hunting day, we I would start walking back from whatever deer blind I'd been in. And you're walking through the woods and the lights getting dimmer and dimmer. But you know the path you walked going out, so you walk the path in reverse going back. But when you can see the lights in the cabin, you know you're headed to shelter. A warmer spot than you've been in. It's a sense of relief. Yeah. Yeah. Physical light that we see by during the day, that's great. At night, we've tried to solve the problem of darkness by putting lights up everywhere and bulbs that burn out. But we're looking for a sense of security and safety at night. But God has provided that because in him was life and, light, and light, uh, the light of men. He's not talking about a physical light. He's talking about a place to go for safety and security. The man was sent from God. That's John the Baptist. And what was his responsibility? Yeah. Prepare the way he came as a witness, too. Okay. John 1, verses 9 through 11. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. Now, true light gives light, doesn't it? And what does light do for us? Shows the way. Makes us aware. Yeah, it makes us aware. Yeah. Makes clear, causes us to know more. You know, the worst time of day to be driving your car is after sundown, but the, lot, Scott, the sky is still light. And everything around is um, at ground level is getting darker. You have to be particularly careful then because there will be things at ground level you can't see well because of the light in the sky. And your eye is trying to, it wants to look towards the light. So your dark vision is impaired by that. He gives light to everyone, right? To who? Everyone here this morning? What about those doing Christmas shopping today, this morning? Does it give light to them too? It has been provided, right? Yeah. Matthew 6.22 says the eye is the lamp of the body, right? If your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light, okay? So if our eyes are healthy, we can see well. You know, I know we're all suffers vision problems. And while he may be aware that it's light in the room, he can't see well enough to read. 
That's very frustrating for him. And, you know, when Luke writes in Luke eleven thirty four, your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But when it's bad, your body is full of darkness. Now, is he talking about our physical eyes here? If you read Luke and you understand what John's saying, what he's talking about is the light that's been provided to everyone is not affecting your life if your eye is bad. In Matthew, a little bit later in verse 18, 9, if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, it's better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. Is he talking about physically removing your eye? No, he's not. He's talking about remove that which causes darkness in your life. That's, that's completely in concert with what John is telling us, to get rid of that. Tear that part of your life out. It's, if you've been baptized into Christ and that's still a problem for you, then that needs a lot of prayer. You probably need someone in the church you trust to be your, I'll say, a prayer partner, although I don't want to get go down the road of the... What was that movement in the 70s in Florida? Boston. Uh, but that's prior to Boston. This was started in Florida. Gainesville, Florida. Yeah, Gainesville, Florida. Prayer partners, mandatory prayer partners. Can't do that. That's another scripture teaches you that. But it helps if you have somebody that knows about the problems you have and is praying about those with you and asking how they're going. You don't have to tell everybody at church. You know, some people are a good PA system if you tell them a secret. So you don't want to share it with them. They've got their own problem. But you like to have somebody that truly indicates they love you by listening to your troubles and praying with you about it and asking you how things are going. Let me ask you this question. When you can see the light, are you in the light? Not necessarily. If you're in darkness and you can see the light, are you in the light? Apologies to those I pointed at. No, you're still in darkness. You may be moving towards the light. Remember what Jesus said about, you know, don't, don't put your lamp under a bushel. A city on a hill can't be hidden. It's because of the light that comes from it. How then do you get in the light? Move to it and walk in it. You know, there's a sad, sad fact of the matter is some people try to find the edge of the light and walk there. All right, there's actually a verse or two, I think it's in Jeremiah. I did a lesson on where's the edge of the light one time. There is a verse in Jeremiah, I believe it is. If I'm remembering correctly, it talks about those that walk in the twilight as it's getting darker towards the edge of the light and they start stumbling. That's because they've moved far enough away from the light they can't see clearly. But Christ has come to, he's the, the true light that gives light to everyone. So that's not an issue if we're truly interested in that. If we don't have a bad eye that keeps wanting us to do the wrong things. He was in the world. So who was it that created the world? And Christ. The creator set aside his glory in heaven to show us how to live. And the only way to do that, apparently, was to become like us. He made the world, he made it, and it belongs to him. 
He was not known by the world. Mankind who he created refused to acknowledge him. We'll take a, a look at that here in a second. He came to his own, which own? His own people, right? Uh, who were the Israelites supposed to be? God's chosen people. He came to his own and he wasn't received by his own people. The word there in Greek means accepted or held in close fellowship and agreement with. Now, I sometimes wonder if, if using the word accepted is a source of some of the denominational error where there's too many of them that preach that accept Christ as your savior. There's actually a billboard on I-20 headed towards East Texas that has that on it, accept Christ as your savior. That's not quite the complete picture. John 12, 13. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood or the will, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. So to those that did receive him, now this is a different verb. The previous one in Greek is paralambano. And that prefix para is where we get parallel from. So walking, accepting beside him. But this one is come to believe. Could also be translated accept, except it doesn't have that para prefix. It's just the root verb. Matthew 13, 20 and 21 is talking about a man from the parable of the sowers. As for what was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. He's not really invested in it. He's not wanting to stay in the light. He wants to escape the persecution. Those who believed in his name. That, that verb there, pistuo, believe in or be convinced of or trust. And I know I've beat that drum before. You have to be convicted convinced that Jesus is the Christ. A lot of people claim Jesus. When I was early in my Christian life, my favorite verse in the Bible was Luke 6, 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? If you're going to call Jesus Lord, you have to do what he says. He says in Matthew 7, 21, and it's not those that call him Lord that are going to enter the kingdom of heaven, but, but, but those that do the will of his Father. The words don't matter. It's what we do about what we know who he is that matters. You know, when Peter got out of the boat to walk to Jesus on the water, how far did he make it? How far did he make it? As far as he went, when he's looking at Jesus. That close. Why did he start to sink? Look at the away. Took his eye off the Lord. Look at the storm I'm in. Oh, no. And Jesus rebukes him. And what did he call him? Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? You see, if we're in the light, there's no reason to doubt. The darkness can't get us. John's trying to make that point. If you're afraid of the world, leave the world. Become Christ's. He will keep you safe. 
He gave us the right to become children of God. That's an interesting expression. Have any of you ever thought of it that way? That, that now there free, it means freedom of choice, the right or control over something. Do we have, a, have control over becoming children of God? Yeah, completely. If we don't want to, we're refusing. If we think it's too hard of a life to live, we're refusing. Just like those in John, I think it's John 6, 66, when he's talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And he said, they said, who can understand this? And they turned around and left. They didn't put any time trying to under, find out what is it that he's actually saying. They just said, this is too hard. I'm out of here. That's kind of like the people's, the seeds sown on the rocky ground, isn't it? There are Christians that turn their backs and walk away too. He was born of God, not of man. Though, or or he gives us the right to become children of God. So we're not born physically, we're born spiritually, reborn. We become a spiritual descendant. This is Jesus was trying to teach Nicodemus in chapter 3, which we'll cover in a few weeks. John 14, 15. John 1, 14 to 15, I'm sorry. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This is he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. So the Word became flesh, God in the flesh. Why is he doing that? Because he wants to show us how to live. He dwelt among us, literally that, that uh, phrase would mean camps in a tent with us, so he resided among us or with us. And the apostles saw his glory. So how many saw his glory? The apostles? John's writing this. He says, we have seen his glory. So he's one of the apostles. Is that 12 people? What about other disciples? How many were present when they were selecting a replacement for Judas? 120. How many did Jesus appear to? Over 500. Over 500. What about non-disciples, Israelites and Gentiles of that day and time? How many Israelites saw him? Bunch. A bunch, that's right. Who, was, who all was in the house when they dug a hole through the roof and lowered the man down on his bed? Don't know, they were all there and saw it. How many blind men did Jesus heal? There were 10 of them on the road. How many came back to thank him? One of them. So there was 10 more. We don't know the rest of their story. Those that listened to his teaching and turned their backs on him, How about us today? Do we see his glory? If, we want to. if we've got good eyes, right? But John bore bit witness about him. Now, 16, John 1, 16 through 18. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. 
No one's ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. There's some interesting phraseology here. From his fullness we received what? What's the scripture say? Grace upon grace. What does that mean? Does that mean a pile of grace? It's all stacked up? You know, the original language would actually be literally translated grace for grace. Think about this. Favor, God's favor for kindness and helpfulness that he's taught us about and how to do. So he piles favor upon the favors that he's extended to us. He is pleased when we're doing the things that he has taught us to do. And we're busy doing it. So when we're busy doing it, that's what he's taught us to do. He's pleased and we receive what? Grace, blessings. Standing back from it a little bit, you can say, yeah, because I'm doing what he wants me to do, he gives me more. Is that what the parable of the talents is about? For him that has or is faithful, he'll receive more. For those that don't do it, it's taken away from them. For Moses, the law was provided, but Jesus provided grace and truth to us. No one's ever seen God. You know, Job wrote, or it's written about in the book of Job 9-11, Behold, he passes by me, and I see him not. He moves on, but I do not perceive him. Job 23, 8 and 9. Behold, I go forward, but he is not there, and backward, but I do not perceive him. On the left hand, when he is working, I do not behold him. He turns to the right hand, but I do not see him. But in Job 42, 5 and 6, after Job has been challenged by God to tell him where all these things were you there when kind of statements Job says I had heard of you by the hearing of my ear but now my eye sees you therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes what's Job saying there I had heard about you but now I see everything you've done. You know, Romans 1.20 says, tells us, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. It's evident. Perhaps Job wasn't paying attention to the everything God had created in nature because of what has happened to him in his life. But after his conversation with God, he says, but now my eye sees you. I understand. John 1, 19 through 28. I need someone to read that quickly. We got, it's 945, so... There's not a crowd in the hall yet, so five minutes. Someone read that, please. Now this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take home to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. But now the Pharisees who had been sent to question him, why then you baptize if you are not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? 
I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after you, strapped to your sandals. I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan, where John was baptizing. So, what John the Baptist is doing is causing enough concern to the Pharisees that they send some folks down from Jerusalem to question him about who he is. And at first they're, they're concerned, you know, who are you? I'm not the Christ. John, never, John the Baptist never pretended to be. So are you Elijah? No. Are you the prophet? One prophesied about? No. So what do you say about yourself? And he answers with scripture. This is who I am. This is what I'm doing. And they come back again trying, well, why are you baptizing people? You're not the Christ, Elijah, or the prophet. And he gives them a straight answer. Continuing verses 29 to 34. Someone read that, please. So John testifies, this is the Son of God. He was told on whom he sees the Spirit descend, that's the Son of God. Now, John the Baptist and Jesus are what kind of relatives? Cousins. Don't know how much time they spent together growing up. That part, that's not revealed in Scripture, so it must not not pertain to... to, uh, Life and godliness. But John's telling us there, he's baptizing people at Bethany across the Jordan. He calls him the Lamb of God. That name is only found in the scriptures twice in John and once in Revelation. Now that may be translation dependent, but I don't think the original language supports it anywhere else. Jesus, at that point, on this, and the interesting thing about the book of the first chapter of John is it covers about four days in Jesus' life, the first four in his ministry. He's baptized, the next day he comes by. On day three, he starts accumulating disciples. First to follow him are Andrew. And someone who's not named, but there's so much detail in this that it must be John himself. Starts with two. Andrew finds his brother, Simon Peter, and tells him we found the Messiah. Brings him to Jesus. And Jesus renames him or gives him the name Cephas. So there's three of them. On the fourth day, Jesus leaves for Galilee. Where is he going? Probably to Nazareth, which is where his home was at the time. It's about eight miles from Cana, which has bearing on chapter two. Jesus finds Philip and tells him to follow him. So Philip does. And Philip is so excited, he finds Nathanael, called Bartholomew in the other gospels, and says, we found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, son of God. Matthew is unimpressed with Jesus being from Nazareth, But when he comes to Jesus, Jesus tells him something that he would have had no way of knowing. And he blurts out, Rabbi, you're the son of God, the king of Israel. You've got five disciples. 
at the end of chapter 1. Run out of time, so y'all read this. Read chapter 2 for next week. Thank you. The lesson's yours.